Now, back to that second uh, reason I talked about. The second reason that a healthy beginning is so important is rooted in the brain and what we know about this incredible period of growth that early childhood presents for the brain and how vulnerable at the same time this growing brain is to adverse influences. A bit about the brain then, why, why all this early child stuff matters. It's not really about the kidneys, the heart, the liver. Yeah, they're all important, clean hands too, but it's really all about the brain. We heard a lot of facts yesterday about 95% of brain growth occurring in childhood and those billions of neurons. My, um, let's see how much time I have for stories. Yeah, a little bit, halfway, right? <laughs> My five-year-old is, um, um, is in this stage of asking, um, you know, who invented this and that? Like, you know, who invented volcanoes and who invented the first person? And uh, he, he hasn't yet asked um, who invented the brain, although he did ask me a very interesting brain question the other day about what, if, is there a difference between dogs and humans in their, in their brain? Um, but it's the sort of question that makes you, makes you wonder, like, how did we get to evolving this, this uh, magnificent organ, the brain, that we're born with 100 billion uh, neurons or um, brain cells, 100 billion. So, if you lined those up, if you cared to line those up, it would be like from here to Dawson and back, just end-to-end -end, uh, tiny little neurons. And if they were ping-pong balls, well, you figure it out because the, the ratio is like um, 40,000 to 1. Um, so the, the brain at birth weighs 400 grams. It triples in size and weight by age uh, 4 to 1,200 grams, and then only 200 more grams by adulthood. Despite the above, we, do, we, do, we should remember that there's the second major spurt of brain growth after childhood, and that's an adolescent. And that's, of course, a whole other story. But keep in mind that the young teenager still has not formed those important pathways between the planning subfrontal cortex and, and the deep regions of the brain. In other words, impulse is not yet connected to forethought. So 100 billion brain cells, but that's not really the amazing thing. The really amazing thing is the connections that are being made. 100 trillion is what we peak out at. That begins to sound like the GNP of the United States or something, but, or at least what it was before a few days ago. Um, the, the brain is growing so fast in early childhood that 700 of these synaptic connections are being made every second. So the brain is modeling remodeling, shedding unnecessary pathways as a child is literally gathering intelligence and starting to make sense of the world around her. The formation and the pruning, the so-called pruning of these connections, in other words, getting rid of the ones that are not necessary, is shaped, of course, by the environment in which the child is growing and the experiences being lived by the child. And it's this early shaping of the brain's architecture that is in turn shaping that child's future. So what influences brain growth? Let's look at some of these environmental influences that will either enhance or hinder the development of that child's brain. Positive influences. Well, food. Let's start with a healthy, nutritious pregnancy. The pregnant woman really is eating for two. Extra calories are required to support that developing fetus and the brain. A balanced diet, just as we recommend for adults, but a little more. Fruits and vegetables, healthy protein sources, healthy fats. Multivitamins are commonly recommended to make sure that all the nutrients are present. The crucial supplement, though, in pregnancy, and ideally started well before conception, is folic acid to prevent neural tube defects and potentially to lower the risk of other birth defects as well. Activity. There's some evidence that at the molecular level, exercise or physical activity influences brain development. Activity, of course, is positive. Babies uh, need to move not just to develop their muscles and bones, but those synaptic connections depend on moving parts. Sleep, got to have it. We all need to have more of it. The opposite in a way of activity, but just as important, arguably more so. During sleep, the developing brain is recollecting information, organizing it, making sense of it, and puts it into long-term storage. Active REM sleep, which babies spend a lot of time in, is almost like simulated activity. So it's helping, again, laying down those connections. Newborns need 16 hours a day, at least 14 hours a day for babies. Toddlers, 10 to 14. And I would err on the side of 13 to 14 rather than the 10 for toddlers. A nurturing environment. The growing brain's main purpose in life 
is a bit like an aspiring politician. It's all about making connections. The richer the child's environment, the richer those connections are made. But when I say richer, of course, I don't mean exposure to riches or fancy cars or video games. The richness is in human interactions. The brain is feeding off what the senses are sensing. And the senses are taking in the smells, sounds, sights, feels of the people around them. Colors and shapes, tastes, music, they're all positive influences for the brain. The big influence is in the human interactions, mainly with the, the parents, the mother, but importantly also with other people in, connected to that family and other people in the household. And babies are not just soaking it up. They're actively engaged in this two-way conversation with others around them. They look feed on our eyes as parents and caregivers. They grunt, squeal, and cry, of course, and these are all communications that demand a response. This laying down pathways is a very active process. This is the so-called serve and return. Send a message out, get something back. I think of those kind of those space scenes where a little rocket docks into the mothership and, and, and fuels up. It's, it's that kind of connection, that's the, this, this um, back and forth, which is so crucial. So at the same time, there are a host of negative influences to this rapidly growing and therefore vulnerable brain, and let's examine a few of these in no particular order. Uh, screen time, there's, there's little doubt that visual technology is changing our patterns in general of learning and attention. There may be some positive results, increased reaction time in certain circumstances, but there are definitely concerns. One review points to the finding from Stanford in 2002 that every hour spent in video games or television decreased our ability to read facial expressions or to perceive meanings of social subtle gestures. That's kind of alarming. Screen viewing ensures passivity and does nothing to enhance the developing brain, taking away instead from the all-important serve and return human-to-human -human interaction. Other negative influence, well, deficiencies of something. Uh, nutrition, of, uh, principally, even though a, a fetus in a, pregnant, uh, in a pregnant woman tends to be protected almost above everything else, the fetus will suffer when the mum is deprived of food. So pregnancy is never a time for, of course, for, for, for dieting or weight loss or changes to the diet. Deficiencies of sensory input. One, one sense closely connected, of course, to language development is, of course, hearing. And that's why newborn screening, which occurs in Yukon, is so important. Then excesses of, of, of toxic substances. Perhaps the most important physical toxin here is alcohol. We know all the damage that alcohol does to the brain. The effects of alcohol in the brain are unpredictable. Enough that we can only say there is no known safe amount of alcohol in pregnancy. Cessation of alcohol, of course, should occur as soon as a woman knows she is pregnant. But ideally, that is one of the conversations and decisions that should occur well before conception when pregnancy is either planned or contemplated or even possible. Smoking. Smoking raises the, the rate of small for gestational age children. They don't do as well in the early months. And there may be other later in life outcomes to the babies as well. There are many, many other toxins, of course, environmental toxins that we may be less familiar or less prevalent in individual exposures, but in sufficient dosage could have effects in childhood or beyond. Think phthalates, uh, plastics, lead, arsenic, mercury, pesticides. There's a host. Stress and toxic stress. Um, so, th th so what is this about stress? Stress is important. Hans Selye of Montreal basically invented stress. Well, perhaps not, but he did really put the term into usage and, and more importantly recognize that, it, that as human beings, we need to be stressed to develop. No life, of course, is without stress. Even children encounter stressful circumstances all the time. As they learn to handle stress, to cope with it, they develop what we call resilience. In supportive environments, children learn important coping mechanisms to deal with stress, the stress of being alone, the stress of making transitions from school to home, from home to school, from dressing by yourself, the stress of meeting new people, of entering new situations. But now think about violence in the home, or a parent who's addicted, a divorce, neglect, some other traumatic event in the home. Some such 
of toxic stresses as these have deleterious effects on the developing brain, direct deleterious effects. What happens at the brain level? Well, cortisol is released as a stress response. This is what the body needs in its fight or flight response. Then a chemical cascade allows the body in an evolutionary sense to respond to danger. You see a bear, you run or you fight like hell. But when this response mechanism is triggered over and over, it learns to respond to even minor triggers. Kids become anxious. They develop disorders of behavior. What happens after that is both fascinating and alarming. Here, with the adverse influence, here the adverse influence of toxic stress, neglect, abuse, the deprivation of poverty, begins that pathway towards chronic disease and later life likely mediated through excessive inflammation in a number of body systems, in turn provoked by these high levels of cortisol and stress release chemicals. As well as higher chronic disease risks, these kids may then engage in risky behavior and invoke injury and disability. They, they become anxious or depressed as adults, get into trouble, end up with addictions, all because of the effects of, that toxic stress produces on the developing brain. In other words, stress becomes toxic when excess stress occurs in, that, in an unsupported environment, the positive of stress turns to negative. 